Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Bridging is the work of FaithBridge to make more and stronger disciples who make more and stronger disciples outside the walls of the church. It's the opportunity for faith bridgers when they leave Faith Bridge to go and make a difference in the world. I think every faith bridger that is a believer in Jesus Christ is a missionary, and I believe that every person has a, a significant calling to serve beyond the walls of Faith Bridge. God has commissioned us to go. That's an exciting thing. We, um, we get to be a part of what God's doing. We have been blessed so that, not so we can hoard our blessings, but so we can go and bless others. And ultimately, the biggest blessing we can ever bless someone with is the truth of Jesus. A missionary doesn't have to go to Africa to be a missionary. You can be a missionary with your neighbors. You can be a missionary in the community. You can be a missionary wherever. We have a great variety of people that serve outside the walls of Faith Bridge. Um, and that's a joy to connect people right here in our local community. There's so many needs. We can connect them with our nonprofit, Bridging for Tomorrow, that is right in our backyard. Then there's those who really feel the push to travel. We send uh, anywhere between 100 and 200 faith bridgers every year on short-term mission trips all over the globe. Well, fundamentally, we do this because we're commanded to. Jesus was clear in the Great Commission that his followers are to go and make disciples of all nations. We want to be obedient to Jesus, but we also want to love people and help them step into the life that uh, can only be found in Christ. If someone wants to be involved in the bridging efforts of Faith Bridge, there are all sorts of easily accessible, practical opportunities to be involved right here, whether it's through Bridging for Tomorrow or one of our other dozen or so local partners that we have in ministry. I also strongly encourage people, if they've never been on a mission trip, to go. You find your faith challenged, you find your assumptions challenged, you find opportunities to trust Jesus in ways perhaps that you never have before. It wasn't convenient, it wasn't easy, it was nothing I had dreamed about doing, but it was clearly everything that I was, that I was supposed to be doing. I had known that through my readings and I had, I had experienced that through my discipleship to a certain degree, but I didn't live it until I went on the mission trip. It's as easy as letting someone know that you want to do it, and our mission and ministry will be happy to do everything we can to get you involved. You know, the easiest thing in the world for a Christian to do is to stay comfortable. But the only way that our faith is gonna grow, the only way we're gonna learn how to trust God is to put ourselves in positions where we have to do that. We're all busy, we're all too busy, and it's really doing an, a self-inventory of how am I spending my time and is it purposeful towards building God's kingdom. Yeah, and getting to partake in what God's doing no matter where it's at, whether it's here or whether it's halfway around the world um, is an honor and a privilege and, and I pray that we all always see it like that. Uh, I can't always guarantee that the food is gonna be the best, that the accommodations are going to be the best, but what I can guarantee is that you will meet Jesus in a way like you've never met him before. Your faith will be stretched like it's never been stretched before. And you will find a joy that can't be found anywhere else beyond knowing that you are participating in the mission of Christ and walking in obedience to what he has called us to do. Amen to that. Great to see all of you here today. We are so glad that you have chosen to come and worship with us at Faith Bridge, whether you are at the Klein campus in Center Court East or West, or if you are at the Woodlands campus, or if you are joining us via online from somewhere around the globe, it's great to have each and every one of you worshiping with Faith Bridge today. We are in the midst of a sermon series that we're calling Salt and Light. It's all about how to demonstrate the love of Jesus in very practical ways to a dying world, a lost world. And as we continue the series, today we are blessed 
to have with us uh, Mr. Martin Durham. Martin is the leader of a ministry in London, England called K180. K180 is all about equipping people to share their faith in vital sorts of ways that are going to make a difference in people's lives. I know you're going to be blessed by his message, so let's give a warm faith bridge welcome to Martin Durham. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you, Pastor Dan and Pastor Ken. Thank you, everyone, for your, for your welcome. I've been here for a week now. Uh, it's been a great week here in Houston. Uh, I'm always amazed at how far Pastor Dan and others will go to make me feel so welcome, even down to this glorious weather we've been having. So thank you so much. It's been super this week. I, I felt right at home here in Houston. So thank you. Um, I bring greetings, greetings from the United Kingdom. Uh, some of you may know that as the homeland. So greetings from across the pond. Greetings from my wife, Rachel, uh, daughters, Annie and Eliza, and all those that are involved with our ministry back there in London. Uh, I hope my, my voice is not too difficult for you. Uh, I would use the word accent, but I don't think I have an accent. Uh, you, you have the accent, but I hope you understand my, uh, my language. Um, K180 is a ministry that I've been involved with leading for some time now, and uh, the heart, really, well, the vision of K180 is Europe ablaze with the gospel. That's what we see. That's where we believe God is taking us. We believe that's what God would want for the continent of Europe. And our part in that really is to proclaim the gospel and to help others, particularly young evangelists and young leaders, to do likewise, uh, to equip them for gospel ministry. And we believe passionately that Jesus is the hope of the world. We believe that it's only in Jesus that life finds its true meaning. And so we spend our time taking the gospel onto the streets of London and further afield and working particularly with younger people in their 20s, 30s. Uh, and it's, it's great doing that. I, I, I know several young evangelists, young leaders across Europe, and there is such a hunger for Jesus, such a hunger to, to make a difference with their life, to make their life count for something. And when I'm around them, I think, yes, this is me too. You know, I, I, I want to reach my potential in God, whatever that looks like. I don't want to waste a moment. So I bring uh, thanks and, uh, from K180. Um, thanks because you have supported us in, in prayer, um, financially, and, and joining us in mission as well physically. Uh, Pastor Dan was with us in the Czech Republic in September as we were training young leaders in the Czech Republic. And this summer we have uh, a team, a student team coming from here to join us on the streets of London. So we're really looking forward to that team being with us. And it's so important for us because we need all the help we can get there in London and across Europe. And so we'll be working with that team and sharing our faith to those who desperately need to hear it. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, the responsibility of sharing our faith. If you have a Bible, you could turn to uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. If, if you need a Bible, um, you could just raise your hand. There's somebody in the aisle, they'll pass you a Bible. And if you could turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I, I am advised that in these parts you know it as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but uh, you can have it on good assurance that the original is 2 Corinthians. So, but if it helps you, I'll say 2 Corinthians. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to focus on the, the second half, but just to help with that, I'd like to read the first 10 verses just to set the context to help us as we look at the second half. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, 
because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Let's take a moment to pray as we look at his word. Lord, we thank you for your word, your word which is living and active. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would open our eyes as we've been seeing and open our heart to your word. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's a fabulous opening to this chapter, talking about life now, this earthly tent, this body that one day will pass away, but particularly looking ahead, this expectation of what is to come, eternity, eternal life with Him. And there's some beautiful words here, that verse 4 again, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What a beautiful phrase that is. Now, it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. It is God who has made us for this purpose. Do you know that this morning? Do you have that assurance in your heart that God has made you for life now and life in all its richness, but also life eternally, life with Him in heaven once we pass from this earth? It's a beautiful picture. Dwight Moody, uh, the North American evangelist, he once said this, one day, you will read in the newspaper that Dwight Moody is dead. Don't you believe it, he said. On that day, I will be more alive than ever before. And this is the picture that we have here, this expectation of life in all its fullness. And we have this challenging verse in uh, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I always find that a challenging verse. I prefer not to be here, but to be with him, Jesus. Verse 9, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice that, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There is no back door into heaven. You cannot circumnavigate the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear. We must all appear. Every single person in this building, every single person in this city, whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, whatever you think, the Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And notice it's the judgment seat of Christ, not some other deity you may want to put there, some higher power or energy or Allah or Buddha or whoever. It's the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And every person will need to stand before that judgment seat, before Jesus, and give an account of their, of their lives. And so we read in verse 11, this is what Paul says to this young church in Corinth. This church is about five years old. And he said, given all that, verse 11, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What Paul is saying here is, because we know of this eternal picture, and because we know that each person will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we know that that will be a terrible day for some, so we try to persuade men, try to persuade people to be reconciled to God. You know, I am so grateful that there was somebody in my life who persuaded me, and it took a couple of years of persuading <laughs> A young man called Jeremy. I've been invited to go on a, a, a Christian youth camp in the middle of England, in the middle of nowhere, where the rolling hills, the green, green hills of England. And I was invited to go to this Christian youth camp, except I wasn't told it was a Christian youth camp. So I was kind of tricked into going. They said, oh, it'd be great. You'll be doing lots of activities, and you don't have to pay. You can just come along. 
So I thought, that's wonderful. And I went along. I arrived there early. And I'm standing around thinking, what, what could I do? And there were two other young men about my age, 17. Never met them before. And one of them said, let's go down to the cow field. And I thought, well, that's a rather strange thing to do, go down to the cow field. But we had nothing else to do, so we said, okay, we'll go down. And we walked down to this muddy cow field. And I don't know how it is in Texas, but in the UK, the cows are kept in with this fence, an electric fence that has an electric pulse going through it. Boom, boom, boom. And one of these young men who I'd not met before, he said, let's have a competition. Let's see who can hold onto the fence the longest. And I tell you, I tell you, inside I am thinking, you are crazy. You, you're, you're mad. You're out of your mind. On the outside, though, being a young man amongst young men, I puffed my chest out. And it was like, yeah, come on then. Let's do it. Let's do it. And so we had this competition. And I hope that you'll be pleased to know this morning that I won that competition. Yeah, I did. I remember it very clearly, I can tell you. I held on to that fence for 21 beats, 21 electric pulses. And what I didn't say to these guys that when I got hold of that fence, I, I just couldn't let go again. It was like, had me there. It might explain a few things today, actually. But that's where I met Jeremy in that muddy cow field. And it turned out Jeremy was a Christian and he started to talk to me just very naturally about Jesus. And, and he talked about Jesus like he knew him, like he was a personal friend of Jesus. And it just kind of started getting my attention. And when I think back to that time, the thing that it, it just strikes me more than anything was Jeremy, a 17-year-old guy who was aware that here was someone who did not know Jesus. Here was someone whose eternity hung in the balance. And I think when it comes to sharing our faith, being aware of what's happening around us is so important. I mean, it's easy on a Sunday, isn't it, when we're in church and all that sort of stuff. But when we go to work on, on Monday or study or whatever we do, it's so easy to kind of just be focused on what we're needing to do and not being aware of what's around us. And I think awareness is so important in, in sharing our faith. Now, here's a challenge for you, a challenge that I, I sometimes give to some of the guys who work with us. Why not each morning make it a, a regular prayer? Ask God and say, God, give me, give me one opportunity this day to talk to someone or show the love of Jesus to someone. Help me to see that opportunity. And it's a dangerous prayer. I say it's a challenge. It's a dangerous prayer because God will answer that prayer. I'm confident of that. Because it changes the way we look at the day and things that are happening around us. A, a while ago, I was sitting at home and just kind of doing whatever I was doing at home. And the telephone went. And I answered the phone. And you may be familiar with this. There was a kind of delay on the line. And it was a bit crackly. And then somebody with an Indian accent said, Hello, Mr. Dirkham. And I said, oh, no, it's Mr. Durham. Okay, Mr. Dirkham. He said, I, I'd like to talk to you about insurance. And, so, and it, I guess you have these calls as well that come through. And, you know, and all I want to do is kind of get rid of him, actually. But as I'm listening, it suddenly dawns on me, here is someone who I think is calling from India, and I could tell him about Jesus. And I sat there, and I listened to him, and then he, he, he asked me a question. He said, can I talk to you about this? And I said, well... You can do, but only on one condition, that I can ask you a question afterwards. And he said, okay. And so he talked, and then I asked him about Jesus. And you know, this man, he was from India, had never heard of Jesus before. And I thought, here I am in my armchair. I don't even have to go out, and I'm speaking to somebody <laughs> in another part of the world who has never heard of Jesus. And when I finished that call, I thought, maybe that's the only time the only time he will hear about Jesus. Just being aware of those opportunities. And I wanted to do everything to persuade him to consider what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. And let's be clear, this word persuade is not a bad word. Some people think it's a bad word, but we're not talking about manipulation. This is for the benefit of the other person. There's no hidden agenda here. It's all about that person and then coming into that relationship with Jesus Christ. And remember the backdrop. 
this backdrop of eternity and the promise of eternity and the fact that we will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Apostle Paul, when he is writing here, he is arrested by this eternal picture. In London, we have this uh, place called Speaker's Corner. I don't know if you've heard of it. You may have done. It's in the corner of Hyde Park. And in Speaker's Corner, particularly on a Sunday, Anyone can go there and you can take a little ladder or box and you can stand and you can speak freely about anything. It's a place of free speech. And particularly in the summer, hundreds of people will come, tourists and all sorts. And there's different people standing on their box saying things. But the thing I love about Speaker's Corner is all over that area, and it's not a big area, there are conversations happening, just one-on-one, two-on-two, just people talking about whatever they're talking about, and often it is about Christianity. And it also attracts uh, a a good number of radical Muslims. We have a number of radical Muslims in London. We know they're there because they're very open about what they want for the UK and indeed the world. And they'll come along, and we frequently get into conversation with these these men. And uh, on one occasion... Uh, One of our trainees was in conversation with a a Muslim cleric, and he was dressed in his robes and things, and he had a few of his people around him. And he was being quite aggressive to our trainee, not physically, but just verbally, just wasn't very nice. And then he said, towards the end of the conversation, it's almost like he was given up, and he said, you know what, when I'm going up to meet Allah on that day, and I see you going down to hell, I'm going to be laughing at you and laughing and laughing and saying, you should have believed what I believe. And our trainee looked at him and said, you know, on that day when I'm going to heaven and I'm going to be standing with Jesus and I see you going down to hell, I'm going to be pleading with Jesus to let you into heaven. And I listened to that and I thought, this young man has been grasped by this eternal picture. What compassion that only comes from Jesus. This compassion for this man who had been so aggressive to him. We have the privilege in our ministry occasionally of working with uh, some young leaders who lead the underground church in Iran. We don't meet in Iran, we meet elsewhere. And um, some years ago, we had a, a group of these young leaders together and we spent a week looking at leadership and things, and there was a session on uh, sharing your faith. We called it evangelism, but sharing your faith, what does it mean? And we asked one of the Iranian leaders to, to, to lead that session, and I sat at the back, and he started the session like this with a question. He said, if somebody comes to you and they say, I'm a Christian, and I would like to come to your church, how do you know whether they are genuinely a Christian or they're a member of the secret police? And I sat at the back and thought, that's a good question. But very quickly, one of the young leaders answered. He said, oh, that's easy. He said, you can tell if someone's a genuine Christian because they have a constant desire to tell people about Jesus. And maybe you, like me, on that day, I was just shuffling a bit in my seat at the back. And he hadn't finished his sentence. He said, You can tell if someone's a genuine Christian because they have a constant desire to tell people about Jesus. Anyone who does not have that constant desire is clearly not born again. And I sat at the back there and I was just shuffling in my seat and I found myself asking God, Lord, what does it mean to have a constant desire to tell people about you? What does it mean to have a constant desire so that I'm alert and aware and and just so the people around me Well, the Apostle Paul gives an answer to that here in in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to skip down to verse 14. This is what he says. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Christ's love compels us. That word compels is a dynamic word. Um, A picture that we can use to help explain that word. If you can picture a river a river that is getting narrower and stronger and faster, and there's a sense of inevitability about it. It's powerful. It's relentless. You just can't stop it. That's the kind of picture behind that word compels. And Paul is saying that the love of Christ compels him. It compels him to call others to be reconciled to God. 
This is the driving force in Paul's life. His love for Jesus and Jesus' love for him. His life has been radically changed because he has met with Jesus. And your life cannot stay the same, can it, when you meet with the risen Lord Jesus? And so Paul says things like, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. As the scripture says there, he was no longer living for self, but living for him, Jesus. You know, when it comes to sharing our faith, what is of most importance, what is utterly foundational, is our personal walk, our personal relationship with him. One of my favorite definitions of the word evangelism is that it is the overflow of our love for Jesus Christ. That's not a complete definition, but that's the essence of it. The overflow of our love for Jesus Christ, that when we are walking and going deeper in our walk with him day by day, it cannot help but flow out of our lives. And that's what we see with the Apostle Paul. John Stott, uh, a leader who is now in glory, he's in heaven, uh, a leader of a church in London, once said this. He said, nothing shuts the mouth, seals the lips, ties the tongue like the poverty of our own spiritual experience. The reason we do not bear witness is that we have no witness to bear. And when I first heard that quote years ago, I thought, Lord, that's me. That's me. Sunday, great. During the week, my life, my walk with him is so shallow. There's no priority with it. And so sharing my faith became a a chore, something I felt guilty if I didn't do, and, and most of the time I wasn't aware of what was happening around me. The Iranian house church leaders, I, I learned so much from being with them. When I was with them, I wanted to ask them about sharing your faith in Iran, because I had heard, and it's true, that the church in Iran is growing strong underground. I mean, it is growing fast, and there's much to be thankful for there. But I wanted to ask them about sharing your faith. And I had my moment, there were about seven or eight of these young leaders sitting around, and I said, I need to ask you a question. Please tell me about sharing your faith in Iran. It must be so difficult. And I tell you, every one of those young leaders looked at me as if I was stupid, as if I was from a different planet. And they said, Martin, in Iran, sharing our faith is easy. And immediately, one young woman said, I was walking to the bus the other day, and I was walking along, and I was praying as I was going to the bus. I got on the bus to go to work, and I'm praying as I go on the bus, and I always look for an empty seat that I can sit next to. And I did that this week. I sat next to this empty seat, and I'm praying for this empty seat when a man comes and sits next to me. And I start praying for this man, and very soon, I ask him a question. I said to him, it's a lovely day today, isn't it? And this man said to me, yes, it is a lovely day. Now tell me about Jesus. And she was able to talk about Jesus, and they prayed together as he made a personal profession of faith in Christ. Immediately, another young man put his hand up and said, oh, oh, I was on the bus the other day. He said, I was praying as I was on the bus, and as I was sitting there, a man sat next to me, and I started to pray for him, and then I sensed God say to me, get out your Bible. And that's a dangerous thing to do in Iran. It's an Islamic republic, where if you're a Muslim who turns to Christ, you can face the death penalty if you're a man. Uh, you can face hard labor in prison for your life if you're a woman. And so it's a dangerous thing to do to get your Bible out, but he knew that God was speaking to him, so he got his Bible out. And very quickly, the man next to him said, what is that you are reading? He said, it's the Bible. It tells you how you can know God personally through Jesus Christ. And the man said, would you tell me about Jesus? And they talked together, and then they prayed together. And as they finished praying, he said, the bus suddenly stopped. And the bus driver looked down the bus straight at the Christian, got up from his seat, walked down and said, what are you doing? What is that you are reading? He said, well, it's the Bible. It tells you how you can know God personally through Jesus Christ. And the bus driver sat down and said, would you tell me about Jesus? 
And this Christian brother was saying, the whole bus, and it was full of people, had to wait until this man had prayed and professed faith in Christ. And you know, I heard story after story after story, and I tell you, every single one, 100% of them started like this. I prayed, I was praying, I was praying. The stories were littered with that phrase, I was praying, I was praying. And I sat there and thought, no, Lord, this is a different Christianity to my daily experience. It's like these believers, they have to pray because their lives depend upon it. You know, it's so easy to talk about prayer, isn't it? It's so much harder to do. We all find that. How often does God find us in the secret place, when we're on our own, I mean, whether that's the morning or night, whenever it is, just on our knees, crying out to him for people who we know who are yet to surrender all to Jesus Christ, whose eternity is hanging in the balance. How often does he find us on our knees in that place? Here's another little challenge for you. Why not ask God this week to give you the names of three people that you know who are in that place? Jot them on a piece of paper and then stick it somewhere where you will see it every day, bathroom mirror or somewhere. And then each day pray for those three people and see what God does because God is faithful and God answers prayer and God doesn't want anyone to be left in that place where they are perishing, the Bible says. So verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And then this wonderful verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. What an amazing verse that is. In the original text, in the Greek, it says, in Christ, new creation. What a marvelous declaration. Perhaps this is the greatest declaration in the whole of the Bible. In Christ, new creation. A declaration that reverberates through time and history. In Christ, new creation. In Jesus, there is new life. In Jesus, there is eternal life. In Jesus, there is freedom. In Christ, if we will love him, if we will obey him, if we will follow him and serve him, we are a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, verse 18 says, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation, right at the heart of the gospel. God intends for each person to have life, life in all its fullness. As one author says, life beyond your wildest dreams. God intends for us to have peace in our heart with him, peace with each other. That's his desire for each one of us. And yet we have this problem, don't we, which the Bible calls sin. And sin simply means we have turned our back on God. We go our own way, do our own thing. Think that we know best and it results in wrong thoughts, words, actions. It just leads to a mess. And God says, actually, it leads to death. The wages of sin is death. The penalty, the result of sin is death. Death physically and spiritually. Eternal separation from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And this is where Jesus steps into the picture. This is why Christians all across the world get excited about Jesus. Because of this, the cross. Jesus coming and on the cross taking your sin and my sin upon himself. Verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. I love to think about the cross and what happened at the cross. Somebody described it as the great exchange at the cross as Jesus gave his life. We were once slave to sin, the Bible says, entangled in our sin. But now, because of Jesus and the cross, we are free of sin. The curse of sin is broken. It cannot hold us, as we sang earlier. You know, the most powerful testimony I ever heard, and it was the shortest, was in Manchester, England, when a man stood up in church and he said, I used to be a drug addict, but now Jesus has made me feel like a prince. 
Wow, isn't that amazing? That's what Jesus does. He makes us feel like a prince. Once we were guilty before God because of our sin, but now because of Jesus we are declared innocent before God. Once we were dead in our sins, the Bible says, but now we are alive to Christ. You know, a few years ago I was speaking at an outdoor event in, uh, in London at Christmas, and at the end of this event a man came up to me and he said, you're from the Baptist church, aren't you? And I hope that's okay this morning. I said, yes, yeah, I'm from the Baptist church. And uh, he said, you know what? Eight years ago, my life was a mess. Relationships broken. I was in a desperate place. Lost my job. And I ended up being a minicab driver, a taxi driver. Uh, not one of the official London taxis, just one of these other companies that try and get the business. And... He said it was a desperate time, but he said every Friday night, two men would come and just talk to us and encourage us and talk to us, and then he stopped. And at that moment, we both recognized each other. Because eight years before, with a friend, I used to go and talk to these minicab drivers, these taxi drivers. I, we just wanted to encourage them. They're kind of marginalized, no one likes them, they get so much abuse. And we decided we just want to talk to them. And I, I tell you, I was so nervous when I first did that. I didn't know what to say, what to do. And often I would stand with these minicab drivers and we'd all be quiet, nothing being said. But this was incredibly encouraging for me. He said, you know, that was a significant time for me. He said, I want you to know that I am now someone who is following Jesus Christ. My relationships are restored. And in fact, he's a leader in one of our local churches in West London. And I was so excited as I heard that. And, you know, I want to encourage you because I, I, I saw the video. And I know there are opportunities to serve locally and further afield. And I want to encourage you and urge you to have a go at that, even if you feel nervous and not know what to say or what to do, because it can have eternal impact in someone's life. And you may never hear about it. I didn't hear about that until eight years later. So let me encourage you that, that that man was once dead in his sins and he's now alive to Christ. That's the testimony that's on his lips. And one of the, the greatest things about the cross for me is that the Bible says that once we were enemies of God, enemies of God, but now because of Jesus, we can stand and say that we are a child of God. That's quite a contrast, isn't it? From being an enemy to being a child of God. What does it mean to be a child of God? I mean, we are loved unconditionally by the living God. He has pulled us out of the mud and the mire, as it says in Psalm 40, and put our feet upon a rock. We're in a place of security. We become part of this huge family of God. You know, there are so many people outside these walls who do not feel loved, who do not feel part of a family. We have good news. There is this amazing family where we're accepted and where we belong. As a child of God, I no longer have a fear of death. You know, as well as I do, there are so many people who fear death. But because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we no longer have to fear death. It's that amazing verse where it says, God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And the good news of the cross and of the gospel is in as much as death could not hold on to Jesus, it cannot hold those who are held by Jesus. Amen? Are you held by Jesus this morning? Are you held by Jesus? This is wonderful news, isn't it? And as a child of God, the Bible says we are an heir of eternal life, an heir with Jesus himself. Incredible. No wonder, no wonder the Bible says what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. Do you know that this morning for yourself? This is amazing good news. But listen to this in verse 19 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. 
Nobody else is going to go out and tell people about Jesus and love people and show them what it means to be a child of God. Only those who have experienced it themselves. That verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his, his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What a beautiful picture that is. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You know, there are many ambassadors in this world. They're an ambassador of the President of the United States, or they're an ambassador of the, the Queen of England. Or, but we are ambassadors of the King of Kings. It's his message. Never forget that. It's his message. And only he can open the heart of someone who you're talking to. And that should be liberating for us this morning. I always say it is very, very, very difficult to mess up telling someone about Jesus. I, almost impossible. It's his message. He's the one that speaks to people. He opens the heart. But he sends us to go and serve and to love people and to speak these words of eternal life. He doesn't want your ability. He just wants your availability. We are ambassadors. As though God were making his, his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You know, Catherine Booth, who was the wife of William Booth, who found the Salvation Army, she said this, when you're talking to people who, who don't know Jesus, she said, if they cannot see tears in your eyes, let them hear tears in your voice. We implore you. We cannot stay silent. You know, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we are left in no doubt about eternity. We cannot stay silent. We cannot do nothing. If not me, who? If not now, when? I want to share a few words with you as, as, we, as we close here. I, it, it's a, some words that were written by a Reverend Sam Shoemaker. And it's about being a personal witness to Christ, about sharing our faith and just how important it is. I just want to read the words that he wrote. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which people walk when they find God. There is no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside, way outside, and they, as much as I, long to, crave to know where the door is. And all that so many ever find is only a wall where the door ought to be. They creep along the wall like blind people with outstretched, groping hands, feeling for a door, knowing that there must be a door, yet they never find it. So I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is for people to find that door. It's the door to God. The most important thing that any person can do is to take one of those small, blind, groping hands and put it on the latch the latch that only clicks and opens to the person's own touch. People die outside the door, as starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter, die for want of what is within their grasp. They live on the other side of it, live because they have not found it. Nothing else matters compared to helping them find the door and open the door and find him so I stand by the door. Go in, great saints. Go all the way in. Go way down into those cavernous cellars and way up into the spacious attics. It is a vast, roomy house, this house where God is. Go into the farthest, deepest casements of withdrawal, of silence, of sainthood. Some must inhabit those rooms, those inner rooms, and they will know the depths and the heights of God. And they call outside to the rest of us how wonderful it is. Sometimes I take a deeper look in. Sometimes I really want to venture in further. But I think my place seems closer, nearer the door. So I stand by the door. I admire the people that go way in. 
But you know what? I wish they would not forget how it was before they got in. Then they would be able to help the people who are outside the door too. You can go in too deeply and stay in too long and forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place, near enough to God to hear him and to know he is there, but not so far from men as not to hear them and remember they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands, millions, billions of them. But more important for me, little old me, one of them, two of them, ten of them, whose hands I am intended to place on the latch. So I shall stand here at the door and take my place for those who seek it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord. So I stand by the door. Let's pray together. And as we pray, if God has spoken to you directly this morning, maybe you lack that assurance in your heart that you know that when you die that you will have eternal life in heaven. Don't leave this place without putting that right. It is a free gift. Maybe you have sensed the challenge to to be more aware about sharing your faith and you just want to talk to someone, pray with someone. At the close of our service, there will be uh, prayer partners here at the front, here at the altar, and it's an open invitation to come, to speak with them, allow them to pray with you. And let me particularly urge you, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and never surrendered all before him, you don't know what it's like to walk as a child of God, then please come and speak with one of the prayer partners. Let them pray with you. Leave this place as a child of the King, the King of Kings. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel, this good news. Thank you that even today across this world, the gospel is changing lives. Thank you that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Thank you that we can stand and say with our head held high that we are a child of God as we say yes to Jesus. Thank you for what it means to be part of the family of God. Thank you for what it means to know that we are secure in your hands. Thank you for what it means to be loved unconditionally. And Lord, we pray this day that you would help us to share our faith with others. Lord, we confess we do not find this easy much of the time. Lord, we need you. Lord, help us to be aware of the things that are happening around us and grant us the courage, Lord, to step out and share the words of life. Lord, thank you that you give the words at those, at those moments. And Lord, we, we want to be those that step out in faith. So help us, Lord, we pray. And we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, I'm Dan Slagle, care and bridging pastor here at Faith Bridge. Welcome to another edition of Postscript. Today we've been blessed to hear from Martin Durham from the United Kingdom speaking with us during our Salt and Light series. Martin is involved with a ministry called Kerygma 180 that focuses on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the peoples of Europe. Thanks, Martin, for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Appreciate, appreciate the message that you brought to us. So. Uh, obviously, the focus of your message had to do with faith sharing and uh, yeah. especially enjoyed the number of stories that you had to share from all around the globe about doing that. 
It's no secret, I think, that for most Christians, talking about Jesus with other people is a daunting prospect, mm. something that some people are mortally afraid of. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think people are afraid to talk about what is, without question, the most significant decision they've ever made? I think people are afraid on different levels. On they? They're afraid that uh, what people might think about them, mm -hmm. uh, afraid of the questions they may get, um, tough questions. Uh, there are different answers, really. I think foundational to sharing our faith, as we, as we see in the Scripture, is is our personal relationship with God. That's the first thing. Um, are we going deeper? Are we cultivating that relationship with Him? Um, because as we go deeper in that walk with Him, mm -hmm. I guess we're, we're a bit like the, uh, the, the, the believers in Acts where you read things like they could not help but speak about what they've seen and heard. There's sure. something captivating about walking with Christ and the reality of walking with Christ and then it kind of overflows from our lives. We're more aware of the opportunities. Now that doesn't eradicate fear all the time of course and even now uh, when I'm about to start a conversation with someone out somewhere I'll have those butterflies we say in England, I don't know if that translates, but that kind of little churning in your sure. stomach sometimes. You're not quite sure what's going to happen. Yeah. But my experience is that often we, we build the walls, we build the barriers before we even open our mouths and we think, oh, they're not going to be interested, they're going to think I'm crazy, or they're going to ask me a question about the dinosaurs, how am I going to answer that, where does that, where does that fit into? Right. But you know, nine out of ten times, um, that doesn't happen. And, and as we start doing it, so our faith builds. And, and it's as we start doing it as a, as a more regular practice that we find, actually, this isn't quite as bad as I thought it was going to be. Sure. And, and ultimately with the fear, and it, this is perhaps a hard statement, but it's true, I think, it, and this is why intimacy with God is so important. Ultimately, it boils down to our own pride, what people will think of us. Ah. I can't answer the questions. I won't be able to, I, 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 I. And, and that's why intimacy, I would still say, is the, is the bedrock. The focus on Christ rather than the self. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's his message, not ours. And, so you've had the opportunity to do this in a lot of different places, a lot of cultures. Uh, I had the privilege of observing you do this just the other night, even at Cavender's boot store. Uh, what are some of the fundamental lessons you've learned about sharing our faith effectively? What are the one or two things that you feel like everybody probably ought to have at the ready in order to do it well? Well, I think, firstly, know that it's God's message. The gospel belongs to Him. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not about my clever words, the things that I'm going to come up with, any illustrations or anything. I, I'm just called to share that message with others. And also, uh, it's God who opens the heart. And that's clear in Scripture. I think Acts 16, it talks about how the Lord opened the heart of Lydia to receive the message. And it's good to be remember that because it's, I find that liberating. Mm -hmm. It's not dependent upon me. Um, and the next thing is, therefore, if it's God's work, which it is, I, I need to be listening to what God is saying. So even in the, in the, the shoe store, the boot store that we were in, just asking God, show me, Lord, is there an opening here? And it may be the man we spoke to, an opening didn't arise. And I wouldn't feel guilty about that. I would have walked out. That's fine. But as I looked at the boots, there was a boot with a cross on it. And I thought, you know, here's an opportunity to ask this guy who's passionate about cowboy boots. Right. And so it's being aware and, and, and asking. I always ask the Holy Spirit to steer the conversation. And, and, and give an opening. Even you know, if I'm sitting on a plane going back to London, that's what I'll be praying. I may, I may be sitting next to someone and I'll be asking God, give me an opening here, just something. And I just start general conversation. I don't dive in with the gospel. Just start general conversation and see what opens up. What would you say has proven to be the greatest sense of reward that you have received personally? Uh, from consistently telling people about Jesus? That there is nothing more rewarding than seeing someone profess faith in Christ and then move into that discipleship, if you like. Um, 
for me, and, and, then, and then seeing them live that out, um, seeing them talk to others about Christ. There is nothing for me more rewarding than that. And it's God's work, and we have this amazing privilege of being involved, invited to be involved in that. He's Great. committed to us this message of reconciliation. Um, so for me, that's the greatest reward, really. Great. Well, thank you for your words of encouragement today. They were a blessing and very instructional, too, for our congregation. And thank you for joining us uh, for this edition of Postscript. Uh, tune in next week when Pastor Ken wraps up our series on salt and light. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.